From the Las Vegas Review Journal Studio, welcome to Season 3, Episode 1 of Mobbed Up, The Fight for Las Vegas, presented by Pro Group Management. Additional sponsorship provided by the Golden Steer. Before we dive in, Mobbed Up contains explicit content such as strong language and depictions of violence, including murder. Please be advised, this podcast might not be suitable for all audiences. May 29th, 1979. It's a Tuesday morning. The long weekend is over. People are getting ready to get back to work following Memorial Day weekend. In the Alamo Heights neighborhood of San Antonio, Judge John H. Wood Jr. walks out of his town home. It's a near perfect 76 degree day. It's back to business as usual as he prepares to drive to the courthouse. It's a business Judge Wood knows all too well. After serving as a federal judge for the past nine years, appointed by then President Richard Nixon, he earned the nickname Maximum John for his harsh sentences in drug crimes. Judge Wood frequently drove his station wagon, but that morning he notices the tires are flat. Instead, he walks to the sedan parked in front of his townhouse. It won't start. He turns to go back into his house. In an instant, everything changed for the judge, and for an up-and-coming lawyer from Las Vegas named Oscar Goodman. Not response. Guest appearance. U.S. Judge Wood assassinated. The killing of a federal judge, or any judge, is an assault on our very system of justice. It was called the crime of the century. 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 With a handful of notable suspects and all eyes on the case out of San Antonio, a top criminal defense attorney from Las Vegas prepares to rewrite history. For the Las Vegas Review Journal, in partnership with the Mob Museum, I'm John Katsalamidis. I've spent more than two decades covering Las Vegas. In season three of Mobbed Up, I go one-on-one with Oscar Goodman, one of the last living legends of the mob era. Now I'm representing every wise guy in the country. Defense attorney for Jimmy Chagra, Tony Spilatro, Lefty Rosenthal, and Meyer Lansky. All of the pro-government think of something untoward or unseemly about me representing them. To me, it was a badge of honor. It's a true story about money. They would win or lose a million dollars in a night in the 1970s. Expensive suits and the limousine and the money roll, you know. Crime. It was just unimaginable that a federal judge would be assassinated in his driveway. And the fight for control of Las Vegas. My clients could afford anybody in the world. They retained me to make sure that the government was going to do their job right. Part one, the crime of the century. Long before mega resorts, professional sports teams, and international headliners attracted more than 40 million tourists a year, Las Vegas has always had a rich history, one that was built on a foundation of mob money. At the center of the casinos and entertainment landscape is one of the most outspoken, unapologetic figures in Las Vegas history. All right, I am recording. How do I, do I address you as Oscar, mayor? Well, uh, my mother called me Oscar. Okay. My daddy called me Oscar. (laughs) Oscar Goodman is synonymous with Las Vegas. After more than five decades of service, it could be argued that he is Las Vegas. My time covering the city dates back to Oscar's three terms as mayor. Oscar was first elected in 1999. Since then, I've seen him at social events around the community. We've gotten to know each other well over the years, but never like this. For 30 years, Oscar was the lawyer of choice for some of the most notorious mobsters of the 20th century. It all started with his first case representing mobster Mel Horowitz. From there, his clients were almost too hard to believe. Guys like Tony Ducks Corallo, or Joey the Clown, or Sal Chicken Wing Testa. Goodman representing them on everything from drug and gambling charges, assault, murder, and tax evasion. So it should really come as no surprise that he would be at the center of one of the biggest crimes in history, a crime involving a man by the name of Jimmy Chagra. 
Chagra was known as the biggest marijuana smuggler in North America in the 1970s, with a legendary penchant for spending millions as a high roller in his favorite city, Las Vegas. Multiple reports claim Chagra used gambling as a method of laundering money he received for trafficking drugs. But it was his charges as the mastermind behind the assassination of Judge John Wood in Texas that brought Chagra, by then one of the top 10 most wanted men in America, and Oscar together on the national stage. The connection? A man named Joe Chagra, Jimmy's older brother and a prominent defense attorney who not only knew Oscar, but partnered with him to defend his little brother Jimmy against the drug charges that could land him a life sentence without parole. And the judge who was scheduled to preside over Jimmy Chagra's drug trial? None other than U.S. District Judge John Wood. While awaiting trial, Chagra, who also happened to be a high-rolling gambler, spent a lot of time in Las Vegas. And it was in Las Vegas that he met a man who would change everything. One night, he's confronted in the Horseshoe Casino by a man who had married a woman who Jimmy grew up with in El Paso. This is Las Vegas author Jack Sheehan, one of the few people to interview Jimmy Chagra. And that woman came up to Jimmy in the Horseshoe Casino and said, I want you to meet my new husband, Charles. He can help you. We know you're in big trouble. And Jimmy goes, well, okay. And he shakes hands with this somewhat distinguished looking guy with a pompadour hairstyle who hands Jimmy his business card. And this is the part that just almost defies belief. And the card says, Chuck Harrelson, professional hitman. Don't go anywhere. Mobbed Up Season 3 will be right back after this. Can't get enough of the intrigue, drama, and excitement behind the history of Las Vegas? Live it by dining at the Golden Steer Steakhouse, the oldest steakhouse in Las Vegas and an old haunt of Tony Spilatro's. You know, the guy from the podcast you're listening to. The Golden Steer has been serving up famous and infamous customers since 1958, from mobsters to the Rat Pack, Muhammad Ali to Holly Madison. Enjoy this classic experience in person or try their world-famous best steaks on earth in the comfort of your own home by ordering today at goldensteerlasvegas.com. Evening newscasters revealed that while on the witness stand, Charles Harrelson spoke of his direct involvement in the headline-grabbing murder case. Jimmy Shagra would later be accused of paying Charles Harrelson $250,000 to kill the judge. It was called the crime of the century for this notorious drug smuggler to assassinate a federal judge in his own driveway when his trial is about to begin. Three months after Wood's death, a jury found Jimmy Shagra guilty on drug charges and sentenced him to 30 years in prison. Instead of remanding him and keeping him in custody, the judge ordered him to return to court at a later date for sentencing. Jimmy uh, was allowed out on bail, which was very unusual at the time. But Shagra didn't show up for his sentencing and disappeared like a shadow in the night. What ensued at that point in time, and that's where we should start, is probably, if not the greatest manhunt in the history of the law, close to it. No one knew that Shagra had moved with his family to a farm in rural Kansas, Johnson County. And they had an idyllic life until Jimmy gets the idea that he misses Las Vegas and he wants to come back. He knows everything that's happening out there. He's talking to all these guys. He knows the status of everything as far as the investigation is concerned. And he only knows the name of one plastic surgeon. And it's a Las Vegas plastic surgeon. And he calls him up and he makes an appointment to have plastic surgery to change the way he looks. And of course, the first thing that the doctor does is call the FBI and says, I got a phone call from Jimmy Shagra, <laughs> and the FBI is looking for him. And Jimmy comes He's a fugitive in, at this time, right? A fugitive, the, the fugitive. Okay. He is the number one. Oh, so he calls Vegas he's to number get one in every post office in the country. This guy <laughs> had more pictures of him than they had stamps in post offices. And, and, and Jimmy, Jimmy comes riding into town, and he's, he's down there uh, on Las Vegas Boulevard, and he. He sees somebody and he puts the brakes on, jumps out of the car and says, you got me. 
When Shagra was caught, he had an outstanding warrant for sentencing in the drug case. He was sentenced to Leavenworth Prison in Kansas. But this isn't where the story ends. It's where it gets much, much worse for Jimmy Shagra. The notes Shagra exchanged with his wife when she came to visit him in Leavenworth ultimately linked him to the murder of Judge Wood, and an indictment in the murder case followed. He it did not focus on Jimmy in the beginning, but uh, Liz and Jimmy were writing these messages back and forth, and um, Liz went into the ladies' room uh, before she left, and she tore the paper into a hundred different pieces and put it in the toilet and flushed the toilet, and as uh, she left the institution, there's an alarm going of a police car following her, pulling her over, placing her under arrest. What they did is they picked up everything that she had thrown in the toilet, and it, there was a trap there that they set. And they sent uh, all that material back to Washington, D.C., and I guess one of the few humorous things that was taking place, as far as I was concerned, I just imagined some FBI agent back in D.C. at, at the lab. He's, he's the expert on, I guess, putting together torn paper. That must be his job. And uh, probably the <laughs> tools that he used was a, a magnifying glass and uh, some scotch tape. Scotch tape. Right. Yeah, but uh, he was a big shot because of that. Yeah. As far as I was concerned, it was David and Goliath with me versus them. April 1982. By the time the first indictments came down, the FBI had conducted more than 30,000 interviews and collected more than 500,000 pieces of information. The investigation cost more than $11 million. At the time, it was the most extensive investigation in the Bureau's history. Uh, the only case that was bigger uh, was, as far as an investigation was concerned, was the JFK assassination. It was the second most expensive prosecution, and uh, each one that was interviewed, you know, they offered them the moon, the stars, and each one gave them a little bit, a little bit, a little bit. And one of the guys that they uh, interviewed was a fellow by the name of Charles Harrelson. If the last name Harrelson sounds familiar, it's because Charles Harrelson was the father of actor Woody Harrelson. In a 1994 interview with Barbara Walters, Woody admitted that his father was not a saint, but claimed his father wasn't a murderer. Rather, he was a CIA operative quite a different picture than Goodman paints of the accused murderer. As soon as um, I found out that Charles Harrelson existed, I didn't know Charles Harrelson from Adam. I'm sure he said hello to me many, many times, uh, down at the Horseshoe in particular, because that's where he used to hang out. Uh, Harrelson had eyes, I think I told you, that did not have the pupil. Uh, they were just uh, robin nest, egg blue, and uh, you could see into his soul if he had a soul. But you could see right through. It was it was scary That's looking at him. And he was he was a handsome guy. He carried himself well, and he looked the party. I mean, he didn't look like Woody. He was much more handsome than Woody. But you could just tell that there was something wrong with him. Goodman knew by observing Harrelson that something was off. His eerie personality and chilling appearance was something Goodman could highlight to the jury when defending Shagra. Goodman was ready to lay the groundwork for his case that Harrelson was responsible for the murder of the federal judge and get Shagra off. January 10th, 1983. All eyes were on Oscar to see how he would defend Jimmy Shagra. Charles Harrelson, Harrelson's wife Joanne, and Shagra's wife Liz had been found guilty of conspiracy to murder, conspiracy to obstruct justice, and perjury. Charles got double life sentences for killing Judge Wood. One question remained. What did Jimmy Shagra have to do with it? Was he the mastermind of this unthinkable crime? The government's case was based primarily on taped conversations between Shagra, his family, and Jerry Ray James, a lifelong criminal serving time at Leavenworth. James testified that Shagra bragged to him at their second meeting in prison that he was responsible for having Judge Wood killed. Prosecutors decided to put James on the stand to testify against Shagra. Reportedly, James had received $250,000 from the government if Shagra was convicted. Goodman knew if he could prove that, it would discredit James' testimony. Jerry Ray James is going to be the star witness against Jimmy Shagra. And I'm into my cross-examination, and I said, Now, Mr. James, you've got money from uh, the government and uh, from the Texas lawyers in order to testify. Well, I didn't get that much. I said, don't tell me what you, I'm gonna tell you what you got, all right? You got 250 from this and 250 from that, right? Uh, 
and you bought your wife a Mercedes, didn't you? Oh, I never did that. I said, okay, look at this and read it to the jury. And the judge looks at me like I'm nuts. He reads it. It's the title to the car in his wife's name, brand new Mercedes. I said, now you want to change your testimony. You're under oath. I know uh, your oath doesn't mean a damn thing to you. I'm saying this in front of the jury. He said, well, I, I, I did. So I'm looking at the jury and they're looking at me. Maybe Goodman's not completely crazy. The prosecution never produced a murder weapon, just one of the many holes in trying to prove Jimmy Shagra guilty for his role in the murder. But a real turning point for Goodman's efforts would come down to a single detail. The moment in the courtroom described by Mob Museum VP of Exhibits and Programs, Jeff Schumacher. So one of the key points of the trial was this diorama that the prosecutors put together showing how this murder occurred. The trees that they created had no leaves on them. And so this would create sight lines that where you could see things from different locations. Oscar took a look at the calendar and said, wait a minute, this doesn't make any sense at all. There need to be leaves on these trees. Once you put leaves on the trees, it obscures the vision and renders witness testimony incorrect or, or unreliable. And this was a huge point for the jury, I think, when they started looking at this case. Goodman did not deny that Chagra paid Harrelson $250,000 but he said it was blackmail money Harrelson had extorted. Shagra's oldest daughter, Catherine, weighs in. I've never said this publicly at all, so you're the first to hear it. <laughs> but both my parents say that Charles Harrelson went to approach my father in Las Vegas to shake him down for money and told him that if my father didn't give him $250,000, he would murder my aunt and my grandmother. That's what my father told Oscar. When Judge John Wood was murdered, my father was in prison at the time. The only tie that the government had between my father and, and Harrelson was, yes, the payoff money, but that was shakedown money that my father was giving. $250,000 was nothing to my father. Like, he tipped that in a night. So if he really was going to have a federal judge murdered, he knew people I'm pretty sure he could get somebody better than some low-level hustler like Charles Harrelson to do it. After almost a month of trial, it all came down to Goodman's closing arguments. Um, and I spoke for six hours to the jury without a note in front of me. And I you didn't say, ah, uh, or ah, uh, or anything like that. It just flowed and it all came together. And the prosecutor was dead bang sure that uh, they would win the case. Uh, they actually had piñatas and uh, they had champagne in the courthouse where they're going to celebrate their victory. February 3rd, 1983. After Goodman makes his six-hour final argument, the jury begins deliberating. Days later, after taking all of the evidence into account, they have their verdict. When the jury came back with the not guilty, the judge's hair turned white uh, on the spot and the prosecutors went into hiding because they thought that they were going to all be given federal judgeships as a result of the win, but they didn't win anything and they left the courthouse in ignominy. The victory for Chagra was largely credited to Goodman. He was the only person found not guilty out of all five suspects in the case. Mm -hmm. Your greatest victory? Your they're greatest all great, case, they're, they're all great victories because to my clients, uh, whatever I was representing them on was the most important thing in their lives. So, But for you? Uh, for me, uh, I had a couple of good wins. I would say historically, it's uh, known as my greatest victory. It's written up in books as uh, one of the 10 greatest closing arguments in the history of the world, basically. But Chagra was not off the hook completely. The jury convicted him on two lesser charges conspiring to obstruct justice by escaping the federal prison in Leavenworth and for obstructing justice and conspiring to smuggle drugs. He was sentenced to 47 years in prison. Like a lot of celebrated criminals in American history, Jimmy Shagra was a mixture of good and bad. His family loved him, law enforcement hated him. He was charming, charismatic, funny, dangerous, he was all those things that we look for in, if you will, cinematic bad guys. In a deal with the federal government, Jimmy Shagra admitted to his role in the murder of Judge Wood and also the attempted murder of United States Assistant Attorney James Kerr. He did this with one goal in mind, for his wife, Liz, to be released early. 
but she never was. She died in custody of ovarian cancer at just 41 years old. Shagra remained in prison to fulfill his sentence. Catherine's mother recounted in her diary the way Jimmy was treated during his time in prison. I'm going to read to you my mother's account from her diaries. While he was moved across the United States, he was shackled in handcuffs that inmates labeled the black box, a punishment reserved for the most ruthless of criminals. These cuffs bolt the hands together at the waist and hold the arms locked from the wrist to the elbow. This cuts off blood circulation and causes painful swelling. After a few hours in the cuffs and hands and wrists, the wrists turned blue and with Jimmy's days of traveling, his forearms turned black. Jimmy was moved about so much, it was nothing for him to spend days in the black box. I'm sorry. <clears throat> In December 2003, Jimmy Shagra was released from prison in Atlanta, Georgia, after serving 24 years of his sentence for health reasons. Jimmy Shagra died of cancer July 25, 2008, in Mesa, Arizona. The lavish lifestyle he enjoyed during his prime was a far cry from where he died, nearly broke and living in a trailer camp. But before Shagra died, he would get the chance for one final goodbye. Author Jack Sheehan. I had the privilege of bringing Jimmy Shagra into Oscar's office when he was mayor. We have pictures of it. And reuniting those two guys who hadn't seen each other in 25 years. And I can tell you, it brought me to tears. There were these two old guys who had had a meaningful moment in each other's lives. In Oscar's case, it was maybe the victory of his career as a defense attorney. In Jimmy's case, Oscar saved him from the death penalty. Oscar saved my life. Jimmy told me that on the record several times. And these two guys hugged and were teary-eyed. And that memory wasn't the only thing Shagra left behind for Oscar. Well, it's interesting that we're talking about him today with my two friends across the uh, table from me. But this ring was given to me by Jimmy Shagra. That's a, a four-card diamond. And um, when I won the case, he had somebody bring it by my office and say that uh, Jimmy wanted you to have this. Matter of fact, on my wall here down at Oscar's restaurant, I have a picture of Jimmy uh, walking out of court with me and where he says, I thank God for that victory and thank God for Oscar. The attention from the Jimmy Shagger case earned Oscar Goodman national acclaim. But another well-known mobster would set up even more notoriety for Goodman a big-time criminal and capo for the Chicago outfit, a man known in the public eye simply as The Ant. On part two of Mobbed Up, the fight for Las Vegas continues as Oscar Goodman defends one of the biggest mob figures in Las Vegas history. Tony Spilaccio, uh, the FBI said, I killed 27 people, and I said, well, uh, shame on you. And they said, what do you mean? How can you represent somebody like that? Uh, he's, uh, he's the devil. He's 666, and you representing him, you're, you're the Prince of Darkness. Tony was contrary to everything that's out there. Always when Oscar was out of town, he'd call me once or twice a week, everything okay, can I do anything? Can I help you? Do you need anybody to help with the kids? He just seemed very sure of himself, I guess. It was like, um, it, it was kind of like, you know, he gave me the okay, and that was going to be the okay. You know, it's kind of like those guys said, he, he runs things in Vegas. You just wouldn't want to be one of his enemies because you might end up, you know, in a barrel at Lake Mead, to put it into a current context. This has been Part 1, Season 3 of Mobbed Up, a production of the Las Vegas Review-Journal in partnership with the Mob Museum. If you like what you hear, please subscribe to the series on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you're listening right now, and be sure to leave us a rating or review. Production staff includes Managing Editor Anastasia Hendricks, Producer Carrie Roper, Field and Studio Production by Larry Meir, Sound Design and Mix by Greg Conway. We would like to thank our Mobbed Up Season 3 presenting sponsor, Pro Group Management, additional sponsorship provided by the Golden Steer. Special thanks to Oscar's Steakhouse in downtown Las Vegas at the Plaza for hosting us on site. And to our guests, author Jack Sheehan, Catherine Chagra, author of Dirty Darlings, and Jeff Schumacher from the Mob Museum. To learn more about Mobbed Up, 
visit lbrj.com backslash podcasts. Thanks for joining us and we'll see you on the next episode.